uh, stuff. But you know, things have changed. That is no longer the law of the land, and uh, it's interesting, right? I mean, that's kind of missing from what it is that we do. So, the example of federal policy. All right, I'm getting out of here. And I'm reminding you guys that this is your course page. Let's go home so you can look at it. You'll say, yes, I recognize this. I've seen this before. One of the things I want you to know is that right at the top there, class recordings, I got about somewhere between six to 10 emails today from my two classes of people saying, I have COVID. I don't feel well. My roommate has COVID. I'm testing for COVID today. Um, here's my doctor's note because I have some other thing. Right? So, what I say? Hey, look, go get a doctor's note. That's cool. But if you miss class, we do have the recorded up here that will help you. That said, I prefer the main class, right? I like it that you're here. And frankly, I think you learn better when you're here. Plus, you know, I think you miss out on opportunities to sing the preamble when you're at home by yourself. So, that matters. But those are there in case you miss class because of illness. Or excuse that, uh, or other excuse absences. Okay. So if you'll notice, it also says we need to grade workbook chapter one. Um, those workbook chapter ones, when you handed them in, if you uploaded them, then they're there, and your fellow is just kind of keeping track. So we put in a grade at the end. Okay. And so, or after you do five of them, essentially. Okay. So just make sure that they're there or you've given them to your fellow if that's what your fellow prefers in lab on Friday. If you are looking at me right now going, I have no idea what you're talking about with labs or workbooks, then come talk to me after class because that's something that is important. Though I think most of you were there on Friday. So give yourself a hand. And then it says things like midterm extra credit. I, 21 people are in there. Introductory discussion. I replied to exactly one of those, but I promise during the week I will reply to more. I'm going to close those at the end of this week. So that extra credit opportunity is going away at the end of this week. Okay. Um, I also remind you that under modules, um, under modules, this is week one, right? So if you miss something in week one, you can catch it right there. Here's week two. For today, you guys are going to read Federalist 10 and 51, and I gave you lots of ways to do that. One of them, the summary analysis, was probably the fastest and easiest. So that we can talk about that. Um, and then for Wednesday, you're going to read the speech of Patrick Henry of Post and House Speaker Ratification and Federalist 1. Um, and then we are going to talk about um, limits, limits in the Constitution, and other things, six principles of the Constitution. But today we're going to talk about how we got to the Constitution, what the arguments were that led to that. And the lecture is up here, the PowerPoint slides that I'm doing right here. Okay. Some people like to open them up and look at them. Uh, in, a, in my next class, someone asked if they could print them off before class and write on them. Yeah, whatever you want. Okay. But, okay, the thing that will help you most are these questions that are right here. And only say was just asking me about it. Um, where are they? And I said, they're right here. And he said, perfect. He said, these are brilliant questions. I could not have framed better questions myself. And I was like, no, right? Get it? Frame so framers. There are only there are only four or five questions, but it does help focus you. And these are the questions that we use on the exam. You keep them for yourself, right? But they may be essay questions on the exam, or they may be multiple choice questions on the exam. And so you can use it to help focus you during lecture. That's the whole point of this. You don't have to give them, they're for you. They're for you, okay? All right. So um, we did fix the syllabus. I think it said we're going to be in class on Monday. I fixed all this. We didn't have anything on there that was due other than Cengage that's been pushed to Wednesday. And it actually in Cengage already said Wednesday. But on the syllabus, we didn't. So that has been fixed. All right. So let's talk about the Constitution. Um, slideshow. Okay. Oh, and I get to plug in my little clicker. There it is. We're doing right now. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually take a poll. Okay. So I have the 
pull up actually, or do you want to do it, Eric? No, I don't have it. I'll do it, Chet. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take the poll. So what I want you to do is I have talked to you about this Cengage app that after you have registered for the book on Canvas, right, that top module, you've gone through, you've done your registration. I should have shown you again, and I did not, sorry. But you go through the module, you register for the book. Once you register for the book, you can download the app, the Cengage app. It's blue with a little stylized white flower, okay? Register for the app or log into the app using your registration that you use through Canvas to get to Cengage, okay? And so if you don't even know, it says activities due today at noon, right after the class, so before the class, you guys do a little bit of a break. Um, so due today at noon are that are those chapter one activities. And it even has little dots and they have orange dots. You can do them on here. But you can do them on your computer as well. If they have an orange dot, that means that you have to do them for a grade. Otherwise, it's just if you feel like you know doing stuff again. Um, then attendance is the next little tab over, and then polls is the next tab. So I want you to go to the polls tab, and I'm going to pull up a, a this first very first um, most important democratic government. That one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is the poll, and it should appear uh, now. It's live in your app, and so you can answer that poll. And it's not in the same order, so look on your poll. It was in the same order, but it's not right now. Can you write down the results? Yeah. You want to type it in there? You can type it in there too. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about this in the last class, and this is the whole base from the last class, but we haven't talked about all these things. For example, we haven't really talked much about equality of persons in law and fact, other than Jefferson putting it in the Declaration of Independence. We haven't talked about well-educated and participatory electorate all that much, right? Just fairly, really on Monday of last week. Uh, rule of law, we talked about at the end of the lecture on Wednesday. And then freedom to believe, speech, press association, and access to government. We really haven't gotten into those civil liberties, other than just saying liberty. So this is all your opinion. This is the stuff we've talked a lot about. And my question for you is, what do you think is most important to make a democratic public? Okay? So as you're answering these, and it looks like you have another, and if you're having problems with the app, there's still 47 seconds left. You can log out of the app and log back in. And sometimes that works. If you're having problems with it, sometimes you have to uninstall it and reinstall it. Okay. Uh, but we're doing this dry run because we're going to take attendance for reals here in about 20 minutes. Okay. So be sure to know how to work your app. This is the time because attendance is going to be important in about 20 minutes. Okay. So there's 20 seconds left on this. It looks like 196. Of you have logged in, that's pretty good. It looks like 247 of you have actually gotten the book. That's good. Okay. 197 now. Eight seconds left. All right. Okay, so you have completed your first poll. It looks like 197 of you have participated, right? That is four fifths of you. It's pretty good. Um, and Eric is going to put this up here, but it looks like that's 62%. It looks like the next one is 19%. Equality is 17%. And well educated participatory electorate is 2%. The date of the poll, okay, is 8.29. I'm also doing this for a reason, okay? This N that he's talking about here, yeah. this N that he put up here, this is social science way or any science way of saying. This is the number of people or the number of units that we are measuring, right? It also tells us the date because later on when we talk about polling, polling matters that day. It's a snapshot. How do people feel right now? Okay. And so as we look at the polls, I'm going to show you some tracking polls and how things change over time. Um, you're going to be able to remember this end of 197 day of poll. Now, is that pretty representative of this class? Yeah, right? And I would say probably it's relatively representative of the University of Oklahoma, in particular freshmen and sophomores. Okay? 
And if I add it to next class, where I'm going to end up with another N of close to 200, I say, yeah, this is pretty much where people's priorities are. Okay. But it's just to give us an idea where are people, how they do. Hit the um, from current slide. Yes. <laughs> What am I going to do in the spring? 
I'm going to plant, right? And so in order to plant, I need seeds, right? Maybe my plowshare is broken, right? Maybe my donkey died during the year, right? Also, my people, <laughs> my household is probably hungry. And so I go to a local business, a general store, a bank, and I apply for a loan for seed money, right? We still use this term, seed money, okay? We need a loan for seed money. And they say, sure, we're gonna loan you some money for seed. And you're thinking what's gonna happen is you're going to plant the crop, you're gonna use that donkey, and you're going to plow your fields, you're gonna tend your crop, then in the fall, what's gonna happen? Right about now, what's starting to happen? You're gonna harvest, right? And then what do you do with it? your harvest? You eat it all yourself? You sell it, right? But there was such rapid deflation, such rapid deflation, that by the time these farmers were trying to sell their crops in the fall, their crops were worth less than what they had borrowed for seeds. Okay. And so what that meant was if they sold it, they paid what they could, and then maybe they sold it off um, those back acres they haven't got around the plow yet. Okay. But it happened again and again. And so farmers started being thrown in jail because at the time there was no protection for you if you were a debtor. If you were a debtor, you went to debtor's prison. Makes a lot of sense, right? You can make a lot of money while you're in prison. So they go to debtor's prison, they're sent to debtor's prison. So we have Daniel Shays, who was, you know, a um, officer in the revolutionary, in George Washington's revolutionary army. And he leads a group of yeoman farmers who had also been soldiers during the War of Independence to the Massachusetts State House, along the way, freeing people from jails, right? Stopping auctions of land, because that's what was happening as well. Because this rapid deflation was caused by the fact that the, at the state level, states had decided that what they were gonna do is they were going to need trade with Great Britain, and Great Britain would only take silver and gold. And so all the state paper money was worthless. There's only one state that issued paper money. Do you know who it was? Rhode Island, right? The only state that issued paper money and so that this inflation did not occur, right? The only paper money or just money? Paper money. Okay. Okay. Paper money. All the other states removed their paper money. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right? All the other states, gold and silver only. And so this rapid inflation occurs. And so we have a big problem. The Shays Rebellion is stuck. Does anybody know how they stuck? It stopped because there's a blizzard. And all the bankers at the state capitol hire a mercenary army to put it down. They said, this doesn't seem like what we are fighting a revolution for. This seems wrong. James Madison, meanwhile, is in the Virginia House of Burgesses. And in the Virginia House of Burgesses, he sees Patrick Henry doing things like passing legislation that really benefits one person. Can you see what that person was? Patrick Henry, right? And so James Madison says, hey, wait a second. You know, we're supposed to be, you know, in it for all of us, but I'm seeing a lot of self-interest. I'm seeing that people are self-interested and we need to create a government that checks that. We keep people from being greedy and creating laws that only benefit them. And so, they were talking about this, and James Madison, he's like riding his horse up to Mount Vernon, having conversations with George Washington, so it's 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 totally not, okay? He's also writing letters to Thomas Jefferson, who's in France at the time, okay? 
And we have the letters, they exist. But these three are really good friends, right? Now, Washington's also very good friends with Hamilton, the Hamilton's on the opposite. But as they meet, they realize there's a massive crisis. Shay's Rebellion has really brought this to them. They don't have the resources as a federal government to tax the people and therefore raise an army to put down insurrections. <sighs> they don't have the money for it. <sighs> they don't have a way to get it. In order for them to get money from the states, they have to ask for it, and the states can decide whether they'll give it to them or not. In order to amend the confederation, all 13 states have to agree. That's not the law, right? And so Madison comes in to the Constitutional Convention with an agenda. And here's a piece of life advice for those of you who are not interested in politics, but are expecting to continue on with life, all right? When you walk into a room, if you have an agenda, People have to respond to your agenda. Okay? James Madison walked into the Constitutional Convention with a constitution already written. They thought they were just going to do some amendments to the Articles of Confederation. But he walked in and he said, Look, these are hopelessly broken. We need something new. And they said, You know what? You're right. We shut the doors. They started working on it. Now, the Constitution we ended up with was not James Madison's Constitution um, exactly, but they had to react to what he wrote. Okay? For example, he only had one branch, branch in the legislature, and that was elected by the people. Right? And then the legislature elected the president. Okay? But one thing that's important is what their philosophical views are. And this is key. People are self-interested. Patrick Henry was a great patriot. He was all for the independence of the United States. But Patrick Henry wanted to benefit. People are self-interested. Does self-interested mean selfish? What do you guys think? No. So what does self-interested mean? Okay, so there's going to be a hierarchy. You're looking at, and part of this is we're from our own perspective. What do you think? You said no to Yeah. All right, is this self interest? What does self interest mean? You're only interested in yourself, you don't care about, you don't care about In part, right? But I think that's more a long self, right? Self interested means, you know, other people may be important to you, right? But in terms of how well that helps you, right? And so he's saying, look, we're not all that altruistic. What does altruistic mean? Selfless, right? We're not altruistic. We're self-interested, right? We want to make sure that we have a roof over our head and we have food on our table. And then we'll think about what's going on over here, okay? Not that we don't care. It's just second, okay? And if we want to help other people, it's good that ultimately we will benefit as well. Okay? So when we talk about things like roads, for example, how many of you enjoy paying taxes? I'm literally the only one. I'm always the only one. I like the benefits. Patty, do you pay taxes? You ever bought anything in a store? You pay some taxes? Yeah. Like, 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 whatever that horrible corner is on that paper, you're going to sit here, you're going to sit here, you're going to sit here, you're going to sit here. Well, yeah, okay. I agree with that. I grew up, my grandmother up in Asia. Grew up very, very poor, right? Basically in a shack in a hill, on a hill in Arkansas. Um, her father was a hunter and trapper by trade. Um, her mother, I don't know. I think she did do a lot of stuff, right? She could fry up some corn grains. 
Okay. But she grew up very, very poor. And my grandmother Huckabee's attitude, I think, kind of rubbed off down through the family, which is, aren't we lucky that we get to take back? We made enough money this year that we get to take back. Right? That's her attitude. And it's rubbed off on me. So I'm literally usually the only person. Um, yeah. You like to have a cup of coffee. You like the benefits of taxation. You don't really want to do it. Okay, fair enough. I don't think I'll pay. Stop it paying. I don't know. I enjoy actually buying things. So it's just a weird thing. All right. So, but the concern is this. When we talk about these taxes, right? How do we get people to pay for government? How do we get people to buy a cup of coffee? Well, we make them understand that coffee is delicious, right? How do we get them to pay their taxes? We remind them that, that corner means people have wrecks there every two months. We threaten them with jail time. Right? If you can also threaten them with jail time. That works. And that works. <laughs> Let's be end, real. Right? Um, <laughs> but, I mean, part of it is, hey, look, there's some benefits we have. Because you pay taxes, you get to come to public university. Right? This doesn't exist. Well, uh, and part of that is this, right? When we talk about who we elect to the legislature, the Oklahoma State Legislature pays one in ten dollars for this. The state of Oklahoma pays one in ten dollars. That's not nothing, it's ten percent, right? But we're electing representatives to make that decision. They used to pay 60, 70, 80 percent. They don't anymore. Why not? Why not? Think about that. Okay. So, in terms of taxes, what does it pay for? Well, it pays for things we really like, like roads and schools. But we have to make sure that it does. People are self interested. And if people are more interested and have louder voices, then their voices get heard more. Madison says, hey, look. We need to create a government that can contain that self-interest, that ambition. Because ambition is good. What's good about ambition? What do you want to be when you grow up? What's your plan? Any plans? Any things you like? How are you? What? You want to go to med school? You want to be a doctor? Okay. That's ambition, right? To be a doctor? What other ambitions? What's your ambition? Yeah. Um, I want to be a geographer, but I don't know what that looks like. All right. So, geographer, but I don't know what that looks like. Fair enough. No ambition. What's your ambition? Sure. You want to play in the show. Sure. Right? All right. What's your ambition? <clears throat> An ELA education teacher. What's your ambition? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's your ambition? Watch out for that kind of And do what? You want to build stuff? Yeah. You want to build stuff, right? What's your ambition? Okay. What's your ambition? Sports agent. All right. We have ambitions. That's good. Because if we're ambitious, then we try to achieve and we become, remember that whole thing with Jefferson? Being all you can be. We become fulfilled. And then we become the best that humanity can be because we're all doing it. Okay? But people are self interested. And so we have to create a government that contains that self interest at the same time it uses it, does it perfect. Madison says the distribution of wealth is the cause of political conflicts. He says this in 1787. The distribution of wealth is the cause of political con conflict. Mark says this a hundred years later, right? But they say two different things. Madison says this distribution causes conflict, so we have to protect those who have wealth and are making wealth, who are using their efficient, understand his understanding of property. We have to protect those who are living up to their potential and using their property. 
and he still has some limits in here. He could just very well be it. Okay. Mark says a hundred years later that it's a root cause of political conflict, so we should get rid of inequality. Right? Madison says no. Let's imagine that they're having this debate in real time. Madison would say, no, you can't do that because then you get rid of ambition. And ambition is what pushes us forward. And Mark says, but inequality. And Madison says, so government needs to do something to control it, to keep it, to make sure people are living up to their potential, but at the same time are not crushing other people. He's going to say that factions are going to arise from the unequal distribution. The most dangerous factions in Madison are those with little or no property, aka the majority of people. Because he also sees them, remember his idea of property? It's not just money. It's also what? What else is property? I talked about it a little bit on this. It's ideas, right? It's hard work. It's talent, right? He said it's all those things. And so we've got to be careful. Madison is probably a little less egalitarian than Jefferson, to be fair. Okay? He thinks it's very clear that there's this kind of talent that's better than this kind. I think Jefferson is more likely to say, yeah, I don't know. I think there's all kinds of talent. He sees the job of government to protect the minority and the minority's property. And this goes with law, right? That's a job of government. And he thinks that balanced government will keep government from being seized by one faction. And that's a real concern, right? In other words, he's saying by creating these checks and balances, we're going to make sure that someone does not get into a role of power or a group of people in a position of power and then run roughshod over everybody else. It's our concern. Is it working? It's not. All right. Is it not working? This way. Okay, sorry. All right, so 1051. Um, so in Federalist 10, right, in particular, Madison is talking about factions. And when he talks about factions, is there anything that stood out to you, a particular part about factions that stood out to you in Federalist 10? This is the thing you remember from Federalist 10, are you ready? This is the thing you remember from Federalist 10. He says this. He says, air is to fire as liberty is to faction. To get rid of the root cause in the case of fire, air, in the case of faction, liberty, would be worse to get rid of the to cure it by getting rid of the root cause would be worse than having factions and fires. Okay. He says, so because of this, air is to fire as liberty is a faction. We have to protect liberty, but be wary of faction. Okay. Just be more wary of fire. Right? I love starting fights. How many of you enjoy? Okay. How many of you are male? Raise your hand. Out of those of you who are male, if you don't like starting a fire, put your hand down. So, um, I love women, fire. how many of you enjoy starting fires? Like in our choir group? Yeah. No, like a, a bonfire. Like on the lawn. It's not possible to. Right. Okay. So, um, my point is this, right? A fire that is well contained in my fire pit, in my fireplace. I enjoy that quite a lot. 
Also, you know, on the stove, for example, when I like to cook something, fire, useful, but it's all contained. Right? And so we have to do the same thing with that. He says, by dividing government, we are going to make government more deliberative. We're going to make them compromise. And so how many of you get frustrated at the pace of government? You think, oh, I voted, things should change. How many of you have ever thought that way? A few? I, I think this is a common concern. People say, hey, I like to do, do it, right? But government is specifically designed so that it takes time. And people do have to compromise. And when you stop compromising, nothing gets done. You have to compromise. But we'll talk about this later policy. The faction is going to check faction. Power is going to check power. I want different things than you want. And so as we are working to fulfill everything that we can be, we're going to check each other. Okay? And then eventually, deliberative pool says prevail. Just the idea. Madison's much more pessimistic on human nature than Jefferson was. He's much more Abigail Adams than John Adams. John Adams is like, we are totally in this together, and we shall rule and create a great utopia, and everything will be equal and fair and wonderful, and there'll be liberty. And Abigail's like, hey, we need some law. Right? Madison is there, right? He's with Abigail. It's also protecting the property rights. Because like I said, he's a really smart guy. He's a first graduate student in America. Okay? At age 16. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's Okay? And also, he's very wealthy. He's very protected. Uh, but also fearful of unwise majority inflamed by demagogues. So here is your first vocabulary word of the semester, demagogue. What is a demagogue? What is a demagogue? Did I say that? Say your hand. He's like, no, you were discussing the close of your hand. I thought you were trying to like secretly. What's a demagogue? Google says a political leader who seeks support by appealing to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people rather than by using rational arguments. All right, a demagogue. In other words, someone who appeals to emotion and inflames emotion, particularly fear. Fear is easiest. Hope also works, but fear is easier, okay? Someone who appeals to that rather than using rational arguments, okay? This is something they're really afraid of. They're really afraid of these arguments that are emotional. Aaron, you got something? Kind of like a gaslighter. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely a gaslighter, right? Somebody who's gonna tell you that things are, you know, insane when they're not insane. Right? So in the Constitution, we create some technologies. We have these separation of powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, all right? And they're going to overlap. Now, this idea that there are different ranks of government, that's all Montesquieu, okay? Montesquieu comes up with Madison implements it for the first time. But when Madison implements it, when the founding fathers together implement it, they also recognize that it's not enough that they stay in their own lane. There need to be checks on each other. So they overlap, their powers overlap, and they're able to impeach other branches, for example. They're able to veto laws, for example, okay? And so this matters, overlapping and shared powers. Government is limited by ambition, division, these three areas, but plus we create a federal style government where there is a federal government, a central government, but there are also state level governments as well. This division again divides power and ambition. 
majority rule that's left to the states and the population. And we're going to talk more about that specifically. And speaking of checks, it's time to check attendance. So let's check. Attendance is live. So, the Federalists are going to support the Constitution. There are 85 articles in the Federalist Papers. I gave you a link to them. You do not have to read them all. I mean, throughout this semester, you'll probably read a total of four. Okay? Or maybe five. My, my point is, you don't have to know them all, but there were 85. There's a link there if you want to look at them. They're written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. Madison's papers are by far the most critical in terms of understanding the philosophy behind the Constitution. Okay. And speaking of that, I didn't really talk about 51 very much. So let me talk about 51 for just a second. It goes with this checks and balances. In 51, he's specifically talking about how government is checked. Because he does say, hey, look, we do have ambition. So here's the key phrase you need to know from Federalist 51. Are you ready? If men were angels, there would be no need for government. In other words, we have to check them. We have to check people who are elected to office. Because if men were angels, we would live together in harmony and there would not be a need for government. But that does mean that people who are government officials are just people. They're just people. They're not inherently good. They're not inherently bad. They're people. If men were angels, there'd be no need for government. So federalists are going to be mainly large landowners, wealthy merchants, professionals, lawyers, doctors, and such. Right? And they prefer weaker state governments. They prefer a strong national government. They prefer indirect elections. So, for example, I would elect my state representative, and then my state representative would all together would elect our senator. So that's how we start out with the way the Senate is. Longer terms in office, government by the elite. And they expect very few violations of civil liberties. They think states are going to handle it. They don't think the federal government is going to violate those liberties. They think states might, but that's up to the state. The states, with their, they all have bills of rights, need to be able to protect those civil liberties. The anti federalists are going to oppose the Constitution. They're going to question the motives of the framers. They're going to believe the Constitution is an enemy of freedom. We'll talk about the speech by Patrick Henry on Wednesday. But he says, when he hears about the Constitutional Convention, I smell a rat. To be fair, his interests were at stake. They feared the erosion of fundamental liberties and the weakening of the power of the state. And so, they were small farmers, shopkeepers, laborers. And they're going to prefer a weaker national government, strong state governments, direct elections. I elect you, and then you represent me. Okay? Shorter terms, they just want a one year rule by the common man. And strengthen, strengthen protections for individual liberties in the Constitution. Strengthen protections for civil liberties in the Constitution. In terms of individual rights, the framers really didn't think it was necessary. They thought, hey, look, all these checks and balances are going to take care of that. Plus, states are going to handle police matters, so it's going to be okay. But they do protect some rights in the Constitution before we even get to the Bill of Rights. The writ of habeas corpus, which means bring the body forth. Right? That means literally, if you're put in jail, you have the right to go before a judge and be told why you're in jail. That's what it means. Okay. Prohibited from passing bills of attainder and ex post facto laws. Bills of attainder mean, oh, you're wearing red shoes. I'm taking you to jail right now. So that's outlawed and you automatically go to jail. 
Okay. And so, because it's a lot, I can put in yeah. Judge Dredd. You guys watch any of the iterations of Judge Dredd? Judge Dredd, bill of attainder, unconstitutional. Um, ex post facto laws are making things illegal after the fact. Okay. And so, for example, back in the early 90s, I would go to bars and there would be little cups and they would have tabs of ecstasy in them because ecstasy wasn't illegal and people would use ecstasy, right? And so they would do that, and let's say the next day, it becomes a law, you can no longer use ecstasy, um, you cannot be convicted for what you did at the bar the night before. Treason is narrowly defined, there are strict rules of evidence. This is one of the reasons why things take a long time when we're talking about treason and espionage, because they have to follow strict laws and rules of evidence. No religious qualifications. This is in the Constitution, not the First Amendment. Specifically, it says office holders cannot be required to have any religious qualifications. And then there's a right to trial by jury. So I'm going to ask you what side you're on, and then I'm going to let you go, and we'll start there next time. So if you think you're a Federalist, an anti-Federalist,